Dean, it's July. We're halfway through the year. We enter the back half of the year. We've got a presidential election coming up. We have several rate decisions by the Fed coming. What impact could this have on the oil and natural gas markets? Well, there are a lot of moving parts. And happy summer, by the way. Same to you. We'll see. Let's start with the Fed rate decisions. And what's been, this is something we've actually gotten correct in our outlooks the last couple of quarters. Persistent price inflation has made it really hard for the Fed to cut as much as the markets expected coming into this year. And in the latest inflation readings as of May for the U.S., 3.3% year on year. So it's down fractionally from the last couple of months. It's higher than it was in January and February. And net net, that kind of says that there's not a lot to see on the inflation side that would help them accelerate cuts into this year. So we went from a market that was expecting you know, four to six cuts <laughs> starting at the beginning of this year to maybe you'll get one. And then now the Fed has to be able to cognizant of presidential elections and not be seen as partisan or trying to influence that election. So it really is, for all intents and purposes, the Fed on hold for now, a projection, at least in the market's readings of it, of as many as four cuts next year. But that's really growth dependent. It's inflation dependent. And if they accept that inflation may not come down into the traditional range, the 2% range that the Fed has wanted, they're going to look at the labor market pretty strongly. And if you look at last month's labor market data, adding 272,000 you know, non-farm payroll jobs, 4% unemployment, it's not an extraordinarily tight market, but it's not a loose one either. It doesn't say that this is an economy or market that you need to stimulate by lower lowering rates at this point. And let's be clear that lower rates are stimulative at that point. They're stimulative. I'm very concerned about the consumer. We're going to get into the consumer in a minute, but I saw data today since the pandemic, inflation and grocery prices dropped 25%. I go to the grocery store. There's certain items I won't buy. This is astronomical. And then I started, uh, friends had a steak. They sell steaks and meats. I said, how's your business? Oh, don't ask. People aren't coming in. So you're starting to see signs of consumers are cutting back on higher end goods or more expensive types of meats and they're going to, to chickens, but they're cutting back on eggs. So those are expensive. They're cutting back on oranges. Since grocery plays such a large part in the consumer's daily budget outside of rent monthly or, or their mortgage, how concerned should the Fed be around inflation in the groceries? Well, again, they look at the whole basket. That's what consumer price inflation is measured on. And that includes a big segment of housing as well as the, the grocery basket fuels. Interestingly, you know, in the wake of Russia's war in Ukraine a couple of years ago, starting, you saw energy contributing a lot to price inflation. And so far this year, it's actually helping with price disinflation at the same time that, you know, housing and groceries and other things have been up. So it is an issue. I mean, price inflation is still high. And depending upon how you measure it, the basket on average, the 3.3% that we just mentioned, isn't representative of everybody or everywhere. That is that is by definition an aggregate or an average across all you know, U.S. city-based consumers or urban consumers at that point. The range around it and the consumer stresses that you've mentioned, we are seeing in the New York Fed's credit monitoring pickups and delinquencies. Now, they code delinquencies in a couple of ways. They look at ones up to 90 days that are kind of course correctable. You, know, you can you can make the payment and avoid a repossession, for example. They also look at serious delinquencies of 90 days or more that are harder to course correct from. And those 90 day plus delinquencies, they are up for auto loans. They're near all time highs for mortgages, not not at recessionary levels for credit cards. They're up. It's an issue. It's a percolating issue. And I think it's also a presidential election issue in terms of how people perceive the economy. The aggregate numbers look good, but obviously we have segments by income of households across America that are suffering and, and finding it difficult to cope with this. And it's not the absolute levels per se, right? Interest rates being higher means if you carry a balance on your credit card, suddenly you're trapped, right? Your bill has gone up, you've got payments to make on this, and your ability to just pay it off the liquidity to do that at the household level isn't necessarily so natural or flowing. So it, it's the rapidity and the extent of the change that we've seen over the last couple of years that's really brought this more to a boiling point. The high interest rates are a acting as a tax on those individuals that are trying to service it. There's no doubt about it. In some cases, they're, they're being strangled or they're completely underwater by it. We saw that, saw the Harris poll where a majority of Americans believe that we're in a recession. If you look at the true economic data, 
we're not in a, in a recession. Yes, there are pockets of concern, but we're not in a recession. But the American public, over 50%, believes that. And I think a large part of that is because of their credit card debt, where they cannot service it. And, and I'll give you some numbers here because you alluded to it, but the New York Federal Reserve, U.S. household debt reached a record of $17.5 trillion. That's trillion with a T in Q4 2023, corresponding with debt per capita exceeding 61000 or 88% of personal income per capita. And then inside of that data, there's some interesting facts. I used to live in California, and so I'm going to highlight this one for, for our audience here. Californians are the most indebted in the nation. This is my personal opinion. I'm not surprised. With a per debt per capita of nearly 85000 or over 104% of their personal income. That's scary. They're underwater. Texans, the great state of Texas under Governor Abbott, Texans are 85.9% indebted as a percentage of personal income. That is compared to the national average of 88% indebted as a percent of personal income per capita. Texas is 2.1% below the national average and 18.1% lower than California. The Texas economic dream is working. What role does oil play in that? Well, really two questions there. I mean, if you're talking about the importance of oil to Texas economy, as much as the economy has matured and diversified and has a lot of moving parts, has a lot of technology. If you think of you know, sitting here in Austin, all the technology companies that are located here, including you know, Tesla and Dell, and it, it goes on, but it's becoming a semiconductor factory as well. The, the CHIPS Act, the money, you know, $40 billion that's you know, going in as an investment by Samsung to build and expand chip factories here. It's amazing. But despite that, because electricity costs really affect that, that segment of industry, natural gas helps keep electricity, you know, low, abundant, and affordable in Texas. In addition to having nationwide renewables, oil and gas really are pivotal and a pillar through the entire economy. So it's a pulse story of it feeds the domestic industry, it feeds exports directly of the energy and things made from it. And it's a comparative advantage for everything from fertilizers to chips to manufactured goods to petrochemical. And as long as you have that growing critical mass of all those things, you can manufacture, trade, export, and supply a lot. So it's a robust economy that really starts with an energy advantage. Is Texas taking advantage of that energy advantage by using natural gas to power these new data centers that are popping up throughout the state? It is and could do a lot more of it. So especially in the Permian Basin, where you have more natural gas than you know what to do with right now. So the Waha Hub, it's been in the headlines recently. You've seen these West Texas prices actually go negative, where you're paying people to haul off your natural gas as you're producing oil. And it comes as a byproduct with oil in the Permian Basin for the most part. So that tells you that if you can find ways to take advantage of it, all the better. The Permian Basin is somewhat constrained from an electricity build-out standpoint. The rapidity to permit, to build, to operate, transmission and generation within that part of West Texas. It's just the industries wanted to go faster than the infrastructure can move. So we've been working actively actually with ERCOT, the Electricity Reliability Council of Texas that covers about 90% of Texas from an electricity demand standpoint. We've been working actively with them on a Permian Basin Reliability Plan, trying to expand the infrastructure, expand the access to electricity. And frankly, the more electricity that's available within the region, the more environmentally responsible and lower emissions we can have in oil and gas operations, where you're, instead of using a diesel generator or using natural gas, pneumatic controllers in a pipeline or other system, you can have electrified components within those systems. But the electricity isn't readily available. Right now, we're seeing producers try to move faster than the market can. So they'll b build, for example, a private use network or so-called behind meter electricity supply on their own. And that's relatively costly with trying to do it from utility scale. So lots of moving parts, but electrification is an important part of it that's complementary with oil and gas growing and really feeding this Permian Basin growth that's been so important to Texas economy. To me, the future of energy is hybrid. You need to use all sorts of energy. You need to use oil, you need to use natural gas, you need to use renewables. It, it all comes together for energy independence. And frankly, it just makes sense. And then you could throw nuclear into that mix as well because if the data is all pointing the united states for a matter of fact the world is only going to become more dependent on electricity and energy as data centers come on the rise of generation ai whatever comes next after that it's all going to be data dependent the data centers are continuing to grow and they need power and, and they need a lot of power so we, we need hybrid solutions with the improvement basin sitting on so much natural gas 
how is it being exported out of there? Is there are there pipelines? Is it going on trucks? How how is it getting out of the Permian Basin? So you've got both liquids and natural gas pipelines, and the amount of natural gas being produced, for example, with the Waha hub and the negative prices that I mentioned, you could use more pipeline egress from that region to try to you know, get that directly to a demand center within the state or for export and. As LNG exports have continued to grow, and keep in mind that we're still dealing with the Biden administration's pause on approvals for new new LNG export facilities to, to move forward at this point. There are some that are in the production queue and are getting constructed. That hopefully lasts a few years, but the market being able to sort those out, the growth could, and investment could be even more robust than it has been. If you're going to invest in long-haul pipeline to go from West Texas, even intrastate or over to Louisiana to supply those exports, you need to know that the production's coming and that you've, you've got the ability to build and export the natural gas itself. So far, the pipelines have continued to be built. We're seeing the expansion both of short haul well, gathering system with the operations, short haul pipelines, and then the ones that are going either all the way across Texas or interstate to Louisiana and other places that are supplying LNG exports. That's the main source of growth. And if that can continue to expand as fast as the system can go, then that enables further gas growth along with the oil development within the region. Where do those exports go? Are they going to other parts of the United States or are they going around the world, perhaps to Northern Europe? Well, in the latest monthly data, for example, Texas, based on U.S. International Trade Commission data, a little over 6 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas has gone via LNG to various regions. And Europe's been taking the most, followed by Asia and then Latin America and others after that. But 3 to 4 billion cubic feet per day, close to 4, has gone via pipelines directly to Mexico. So Mexico is actually a big consumer of natural gas from the state as a whole. And then depending upon the season, whether it's you know, this time of year, you're putting natural gas into storage for when you need it for heating in the winter. But you also tend seasonally to send gas to other states. So Texas, it, it's not just international exports, but it's exporting from Texas to other states at times too. Four billion cubic feet of going a day to Mexico, is that to support their thriving and massively expanding auto business? Or where where is that being used for in the country of Mexico? Well, it can be heating. It can be industrial use. I mean, and it can also be electricity. So it's all three of those things that, depending upon the season, you know, will shift. And we've seen, I mentioned 3.8. That's the, the actual number you know, as of April that was traded down to Mexico, billion cubic feet per day. But we've seen that go above 6 billion cubic feet per day during winter season months. So it's an awful lot of gas within a system that's been expanded in recent years. I'm just, I'm sitting here silently because that's when you really comprehend the, the amount of natural gas in Mexico, that's pretty incredible. And if you look at it from an industrial standpoint, that can al allow and potentially usher in a lot of economic growth in, in the country of Mexico. We're seeing the, the expansion of factories, the expansion of businesses outside of what Carlos Slim has built. We're seeing a lot more industrial stuff uh, being built in Mexico. That, that's really interesting. In your reports, you've talked about that there's a record demand for oil and natural gas this year. What's driving that demand? We highlighted the gas going to Mexico, the gas going to Europe. What's driving the demand? Is it just the consumer? What's driving all this demand? So the records you're referring to, we're talking about global oil demand and global natural gas demand. And it really is along with the economy. So there's no form of economic activity without having energy to supply it. And the most energy dense, the most cost effective resources have continued to be oil and gas for that purpose. And you know, by EIA, Energy Information Administration estimates, we're still you know, around 103 million barrels per day this year. That's an all-time high. And growing potentially next year by their estimates to over 104 million barrels per day. On the natural gas side, depending upon the units you measured in, again, still records and you know, upwards of 400 billion cubic feet per day. And in the U.S., to put that Mexican estimate, uh, you know, the exports of up to 6 billion cubic feet per day in context, dry natural gas production in the United States is around 100 billion cubic feet per day. So that's about 6% of production. And it's, you know, when we're talking in Texas, the dry natural gas production currently is 27 or 28 billion cubic feet per day. So this is a lot that is provided either for LNG directly or directly to Mexico. And on a global basis, it really is just the, the growth of the economy that continues to 
to help this go. We see it on the oil side in terms of products. We can talk about which products, but net net, there's just no question that as the economy grows, we continue to need more oil and more natural gas to supply it. As India comes online, rapidly comes online, are we going to see continued oil demand? Will we see exports in, of, of oil and natural gas going into India to support their growing economy? Yes, but maybe to a different quantum than you've historically seen in China. So China has a relatively more manufacturing, construction, and therefore energy-intensive economy than India, which is traditionally more services. Now, whether those services start to include data centers, as you were referring to earlier, those are super energy-intensive. But in the traditional IT services and other things that India has been mainly known for, they are expanding in terms of their demand for oil and gas, but not as fast as other emerging economies that are you know, close to the manufacturing centers. Are there any emerging markets as perhaps Nigeria and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, are there any emerging markets that are on your radar from a demand perspective that could potentially see dramatic increases of demand just based on population and based on industrial growth of their economies? Well. China is critically important just in terms of the policies and the growth, which direction they take in terms of energy transition. Almost, I don't want to say it doesn't matter. It does matter. But the amount of growth is consequential both to oil and natural gas demand. And they are the leading edge in terms of new contracts for these things, both from the Middle East and other places. So that's important. When we look across everything on the coattails for manufacturing across emerging Asia that complements what China has. And depending upon the literature you look at, people either see it as competition, where you're seeing some lower value industries move out of China in, into the region, or complementary, where it really is part of an integrated supply chain with China. Net-net, we've seen between China and developing Asia, a major contribution to energy demand that, that's continued to come globally. Latin America is more mixed. Africa is more mixed. You have spots that are really growing. They are relatively energy intensive compared to many developed economies. But in terms of long-term demographic growth, economic growth, you know, Emerging Asia is number one, and then you would look at Africa in the very long run based on demographic growth as a source of energy growth, both in terms of demand and supply, but having the institutional framework to be able to develop those resources at a time actually when the international community is putting climate pressure on emerging economies in Africa not to develop those resources, that becomes a hot button issue. It becomes a hot button issue. P politics aside here, without energy... The global economy comes to a grinding halt. There's no other way to say it. Without energy, it, it comes to a grinding halt. Staying on emerging markets, new president in Argentina. Argentina has a, a vast supply of oil. The, the president has, if you want to call it an economic miracle, that was Daniel Druckmeier, the famous hedge fund manager that coined that term for what's happening in Argentina. What do you see the Argentinian oil coming online and what impact could that potentially have on the Argentinian market? And then will that oil then go throughout South America or will it make its way into Lantam? Or could Argentina eventually start exporting that oil to the world? Well, I think most people in the industry have recognized for a couple of decades that the shale resources in southern Argentina are as good as any in the United States. So from an, and this is shale oil we're talking specifically, not conventional fines like you might have in, in Guiana or off, offshore of Brazil. But the growth potential of Argentina from a shale standpoint is quite substantial. They still need infrastructure to move it. They still have to have the right investment climate to be able to attract business to develop it. And historically, that's really been the impediment to attracting the business, growing it, and being able to have the stability from an institutional standpoint that would support the transition to becoming a major exporter. It could happen. I think the dollarization of the economy the potential to have a more stable macro environment does open that as a pathway, but it's not there yet. So right now, Guyana is definitely growing as a major oil exporter. You're talking six, seven, eight hundred thousand barrels per day in the outlook. So that that's material from a global perspective. Offshore Brazil, the amount of investment that you know Petrobras can bring and continue to to grow, plus international companies in deep water with the technology and the developments there. Brazil also has a bright future in terms of if that demand outlook for oil is right, that's one of the supply centers that has to continue to step up to meet it. We said earlier we have a presidential election here in November. What impact could that have on the global oil markets from a geopolitical standpoint? It could be a potential fork in the road. I mean, you really have to look at 
very divergent energy policies, you know, one that would be more pro domestic oil and gas development and one that's clearly, you know, teed up a path against it. So a continuation of that for former years with limited leasing, limited infrastructure, potentially higher costs, higher taxes is just a very different look than potentially fostering that development and the U.S. as an export center. That, that actually is a question even with a Republican administration of do you get a more isolation, isolationist trade policy. So it's one thing to say we might could develop these resources domestically, but you do have to have friendly and trusted trade relations to get the long-term contracts, for example, for LNG in place. That's not clear. So th there are uncertainties either way. And and we'll see how that plays out from an energy policy standpoint. But a lot of the, and whether we're talking about the French elections that you made reference to <laughs> offline earlier, what hangs in the balance really is how committed are these administrations with policy continuity from one administration to the other to continue an energy transition based on not market-based mechanisms, but really government fiat. French elections, Marie Le Pen won, won the first round, not an outright majority, but I mean, they have the second one coming up on July 7th. If Marie Le Pen's party takes parliament, what impact does that have on the oil markets? Because I'm not, France is isolated in that, but her impact is going to move across Europe and you could see a very, see a populist movement happen in Europe. We've seen some other elections, but you could see a populist movement. And if that is to happen in Europe, what impact does that have on the oil and natural gas markets? It's speculative, but right now people are, are thinking maybe national rally, you know, wins majority in the assembly, president. Macron has said he's not stepping down. We'll see if he doesn't have government backing, if he'll stick with that. But it's really the following effect for EU energy policies and a question of whether a more isolationist view ends up being the norm, both in France and, and Europe as a whole. If so, you know how that affects the willingness and ability to take Russian gas, for example. It's interesting, Russia's role since war is, the war in Ukraine really escalated. You know, at first, there was a lot of willingness to kind of fight the good fight, put sanctions in place, ratchet those down. We had the Janet Yellen price cap proposal to try to take revenues away, but nobody's really had the wherewithal to remove Russian volumes from the market. And I don't know if a move to the right in France might gird the strength to do that. But right now, for example, the easiest way to make sure you take Russian volumes of gas or oil off the market is to have the so-called secondary sanctions. So the financial market then penalizes anybody who does business with you know, people who end up taking Russian volumes. Instead, what we've seen is that we've had headline reports that even uh, you know, Russian oil has found its way into UK refineries even in recent months. There are lots of loopholes in the system, and the Russians have been relatively crafty at creating ways of transferring it, offloading it, lightning ships, mixing it. Whether it's in the Mediterranean or in Asia, we continue to see very minimal expectations by official agencies of how much Russian volumes might be removed. With the removal of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 gas pipelines, the destruction of those, you know, that those are volumes that are hard, but we still continue to see other pipelines and finding ways into Europe where you know, even continental Europe continues to take some Russian gas. So net-net, I, I think that's the impact of really thinking about how it affects greater geopolitics. These elections moving that way, whether it's isolationist policies or more pro-trade policies. Could a cold winter potentially change these policies as there could be a larger need for that natural gas in Europe? It's a great question because the last two winters have been unusually mild, right? If you even got a reversion to normal seasonality, not even a cold one. Your ability to go through the amount, of the relatively fixed amount of storage that exists for natural gas in Europe in a winter, then you're effectively, through LNG trade, relying more on U.S. storage to supply and backfill what happens in Europe at that point. The market hasn't priced that in. That, that's not something, because we've gone through with a sense of complacency the last couple of relatively warm winters, there's an expectation that the gas will flow. So we're still sitting, you know, what, 2 to $3, $2.70 per million BTU Henry Hub recently, and nothing that dramatically shifts that. Even with the normal seasonality that you see, the, between August and December delivery, I think there's like a 35% difference currently in the futures market. That's large. But it's not historically large if you're just looking at the normal seasonality of what could happen. Well, let's throw another ingredient in here. This is fun. Currency movements. Obviously, elections and policies have currency movements. What impact does that have? So and we talked about the rate expectations and the lack of Fed movement, right? The implication of that is it keeps the dollar relatively strong. So you know, if you've 
you were talking about European rate cuts, right? Without any more rate cuts, people will tell you they can hedge their foreign exchange risk, borrow in Japan and yen or anywhere in Europe and euros, hedge that exchange risk and still earn a real rate of return investing in U.S. treasuries. That's the term is a carry trade. You carry from one currency to the other. If Europe continues to cut, that gets even wider. That makes the U.S. dollar stronger despite all the economic scenarios that we're contemplating. So short of the U.S. dollar weakening along with rate cuts, that's what would really drive it down. And your primary factor in foreign exchange rates is usually hot money chasing interest rates across borders. That's what would lead to a weaker U.S. dollar and then that has historically an inverse relationship that goes with oil prices and other commodities. Where the dollar will go is a wild card. And it's interesting that both offensive assets and defensive assets are both at all-time highs right now. And to me, that tells you basically that there's too much liquidity in the system. And that also works against rate cuts, because why would you if it's just going to stimulate things? Do you see the trend of diverging cuts happening? Right now, the Fed is going to hold higher for longer. We have the presidential. The ECB has already cut once. There's another rate cut on the board. And obviously, we have the, the Bank of Japan. Uh, they're going to have to in increase to get their currency. What impact is all these diverging central banks? Because it seems that the, the Fed's no longer the captain of the currency ship anymore, the captain of the central banks. They're each taking their own decisions. There are a couple of layers to this onion. You know, one is really just in isolation. How do you do the calculus today to figure out what you know, relative to what others are doing, how you can move rates. And keep in mind that lowering rates would be stimulative. Uh, lowering rates would also make the federal deficit a little more affordable for the U.S. And that also becomes an issue regardless of which party comes come November, right? So we have a historically large and growing federal budget deficit that needs to be funded, and it's being funded through that debt. The ability to place that debt, if the debt gets downgraded means you have to pay more for it over time. We have to find a sustainable solution that at some point you know, probably requires Congress to rein in the budget and talk about real spending cuts, or at least spending cuts in Washington lingo means just less growth in spending, but that still has to occur at some point. On the international side, you, you mentioned Japan. You know, their currency has really been rocked by a lot of devaluation recently, and they may have to figure out how to continue to prop that up by intervening in markets. It's complicated. There are a lot of moving parts. And then again, this debt and deficit situation internationally becomes a longer term thing of kind of viewing. We're still the prettiest horse in the glue factory, so to speak. The U.S. dollar has continued to be attractive relative to other currencies. There's nothing better at this, at this standpoint. So that's why you're seeing both offense and defensive assets continue to be at all-time highs here. How concerned should we be around consumer debt? Not just the U.S., but global consumer debt is pretty high. Well, the U.S. is much higher than average. I mean, you have a lot of sovereign debt in many other economies, but as far as the amount of by which consumers are out over their skis, the ability to take on extraordinary credit card debt mortgages. It's exceptional what we have have here in the U.S. The $17.5 trillion that you mentioned you know, in the Fed survey, that's an all-time high. It's never been higher. And people haven't had a strong incentive to really rein that in. And now that interest rates go up suddenly in a short period, it becomes harder to get rid of it. You have student loans on top of it. Another source of debt had been suspended post-pandemic, but in especially even this year, the payments have resumed in a way that's making it harder for households at certain income levels to meet all these obligations. Student loans are scary. They, 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 they truly are. They're, they're scary. There's, there's no other way to describe it. Another thing that's scary is when the Strategic Petroleum Reserve gets low because it has national security implications. It's scary. It's just like student debt. It's scary. What is the current state of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Have we started to refill it? Is there enough if there is a natural, sorry, a, a, a national emergency that it's there to help us? So let's talk about the two kinds of inventories and where they stand. You've got inventories held by industry that are not Strategic Petroleum Reserves. And then in the event that you have a major global disruption, you have the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to tide that over. And I'll try to give you a balanced view here. You know, we started the year on the industry health side, historically low at the bottom of the five-year range, and now we're just above the middle of it. So 
you know, with production, despite the fact that we've had strong exports, strong domestic consumption, the production has been so strong that we've replenished a lot of the industry reserves, and they're at about the 60th percentile, so not bad. On the SPR side, we had drawn those down and cut them in half in the wake of Russia's war in Ukraine. The Biden administration released them, but it wasn't just because of that. It was also an effort leading to the midterm elections to try to have lower fuel prices. And there were explicit statements made by the administration about taking credit for driving prices down in summer two years ago. Well, I think when you account for monetary policy, it's pretty clear that the release of those didn't drive the prices down for one, that that was fallacious. But number two is that where we stand, we've seen some effort to replenish the SPR a little bit this year, but the volumes year to date as of the last couple of weeks are only up four to five percent. So it's still close to 40 year lows in terms of the SPR. Now, keep in mind from 2017 to 2020, Congress had mandated sales out of the SPR. So there was a determination by Congress and the Department of Energy that it was acceptable to have lower SPR reserves than we had like 40 years ago. In 2019, we were sitting, what, around 640 to 650 million barrels in the SPR. Now it's, you know, what, I think around 340 to 350 million barrels, something like that, maybe 360 in recent months. And so we are still substantially lower. It, these are historically low levels. And because the U.S. has the ability to produce domestically, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have something lower than it was historically or even in 2019, but how low is low? You know, if you have maybe 40, 45 days of coverage right now, if you were not a producer, the International Energy Agency would require most member countries to have 90 days of self-provision or the ability to have storage that covers 90 days worth of consumption. We're sitting you know, at basically half that, but we have the ability to produce. The ability to direct what we produce for domestic needs, well, you can produce it, but can you export and produce at the same time if you had a crisis? And now let's talk about Iran. So the Middle East geopolitics, the other geopolitical scenarios that we haven't really touched on yet, you have the announcement this morning where Iran basically said they will back Hezbollah 100%. If that plays out with escalation, where Israel is potentially looking at war with Hezbollah in addition to Hamas, then Iran's involvement becomes one of those major dials that we need to really see how this changes, because whether it's amount of oil trade that goes through the Straits of Hormuz that, that could be impacted, at least in terms of perceptions for financial markets, the fiscal flows, that there are a lot of things that Iran as an oil and gas exporter can do that really affect global energy markets. In that event, if it goes to those scenarios, they will want to have maximum impact. So that how that plays out is not altogether clear and how they keep it in bounds if it goes that direction isn't clear either. So this is all speculative, right? But these are the higher impact, lower probability scenarios of where it could go and why you might need a higher SPR if you start seeing a big shock to global oil prices. We have a cushion by virtue of having the security of Texas and U.S. production. In recent weeks, we've been hitting 3.2, 3.3 million barrels per day of domestic production. Add another you know, 6 million barrels per day of natural gas liquids that get extracted from all the natural gas that we're producing. You know, that's that's substantial. That's globally important. So in a, you know, we're, we're talking about global demand being 103 million barrels per day. You know, we're producing over 19 million barrels per day of liquids right here at home. You and I have a lot of things in common, but one thing we definitely have in common, we don't have access to classified briefings. True. <laughs> and if we, 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 we don't. It'd be cool, but we don't have it. So it's publicly reported, the, the Hezbollah-Israel-Iran issue. Why are we not backing up the tankers and starting to fill up the SPR just because of the potential situations that could happen here? It's it's not just the oil market being affected. It's the global economy that could potentially be affected. Why can't we put in risk mitigation techniques or, or, or tactics to potentially m mitigate for a potential scenario that could have dire economic consequences. Well, I'd like not to be overly political here, right? But you have an administration that's a current administration that's not supportive of the oil and gas industry and the development of it. They have begrudgingly come around to build, rebuilding the SPR after having drawn it down 
you know, by historic proportions. So it's not easy to reverse course politically and say, yeah, we're going to need that for a lot longer than we said we were going to need that just a couple of years ago. The fact is that any pragmatic view of post-pandemic consumption, both globally and in the U.S., shows you it's, and by the way, it's not just record demand globally, it's solid demand in the US. We've been hitting 20 and 21 million barrels per day in recent weeks per EIA estimates. This is historically strong. When you start looking at the fuel breakout, it's not just transportation fuels that have continued to grow on a global basis. The most growth is coming from petrochemicals. So naphtha, gas oil, propane, propylene, the things that go into materials. So we talked about that economic linkage. The majority of the economy, both in a U.S. and a global basis, ends up being consumer spending as incomes rise. What do people want? They want things that you know, basically are consumer goods, where everything from we're wearing on our heads to performance materials, you know, 96% of consumer goods are things that start as oil or natural gas in some way, shape, or form at the molecular level. So consumerism, both on a U.S. and a global basis, as that grows, we continue to see evidence that the world's demanding more. And if we zero in not just from the global and U.S. level, but Texas, oh my God, I mean, you break out by color, you know, in a chart, the amount that's naphtha, gas, oil, propane, propane and propylene, the things that are going into materials, and that's the vast majority of the growth. It's tremendous. And the petrochemical expansion on the heel of having ethane, on having natural gas that's cost effective, plus all the liquids that go with it from an oil standpoint, it's been material. It's beyond material. The, the petrochemical issue is huge. You're not going to get goods anymore. 96%, you're not going to get goods. And you factor that in with record high air travel demand globally. There's a demand for oil, but yet the decisions aren't being made. And let's, let's, well, I'm having fun making salads here. I'm going to make another salad with you. Throw another ingredient into the salad. This is one of the earliest years in history, according to the National Weather Service. We have a Cat 5 in the Caribbean. It's, it's barreling along, causing damage. I saw photos out of Barbados this morning. Very sad. If the United States gets hit, it's going to get hit. Let's be honest. Where is it going to hit? And what hurricane? And what month? Who knows? But, you throw that into the mix, so potentially you have a Hezbollah Israel war with Iran. You've got a major Cat 5 hurricane hitting the United States or, or a Cat 4. There needs to be for a wake-up call. So if the administration is not going to prepare for this, how can the, 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 the men and women working in the oil and natural gas industries prepare for this? Do they start building up their own reserves or do they send tankers offshore to hold it there in the case of a hurricane or a major situation? Well, let's be clear on hurricanes. I mean, industry preparedness, oil and gas industry preparedness, specifically for hurricanes, is a very proven process. And the industry, from a safety standpoint, safety is the top priority of making sure both the people in the industry and the supply chains remain vital. So starting from a state regulatory standpoint, the companies work together through the state and the federal trade associations to make sure that hurricane preparedness is solid. So if no pun, but hurricane barrel, <laughs> if you're talking about barreling through, if that actually were to turn, and it's right now it's projected to go towards Mexico, but if it were to turn and hurricanes seasonally do come through, we've historically seen where there's been really good industry and state responsiveness where the agencies have worked together with the industry to make sure that the integrity of, of the production, you know, when it's possible and safe, that that continues to move and that fuel sources are redirected as needed, different modes of transportation, appropriate waivers of state or federal regulatory waivers that are needed to make sure that you can move fuels where they're needed, when they're needed. So that process has been pretty good. And I wouldn't be panicked about a hurricane coming through and, and rocking things. Obviously, communities get affected when that does happen. And as a growing up a Floridian and <laughs> now in Texas, I, I'm certainly attuned to it and follow it. But the system really does work well. And the industry coordinates well with government agencies to make sure that those things you know, at the state and local level work well. The men and women that work in the oil and natural gas industries care they're responsible and they take action and they do good things that help the U.S. economy and help the global economy continue to grow. Dean, what should we watch for in the oil and gas markets over the next quarter until we have you back on again? Well, we've covered a lot of the main things. I mean, from a financial market standpoint, interest rates are going to determine a lot of you know, reading tea leaves on where the economy goes and where rates can go will have an impact. Historically, we didn't go into blow by blow on it, but 
this inverse relationship between interest rates that affect the dollar and then the inverse relationship between the dollar and oil prices historically, either as a commodity hedging strategy or just mechanically in terms of how it affects the price in local currency terms around the world of oil and related products. That is one uncertainty. The geopolitics are worth watching. The presidential election is another wild card, and, and we'll see. All of these things are structurally important to where these markets can go. We're seeing changes in the regulatory environment. We're seeing important things play out you know, through litigation at the federal level that, that could have impact, plus the trusted trade relationships and where those go. So a lot of moving parts that make it hard when you're talking about five, ten billion dollar investments at a time to have the certainty to move forward. Yet the system's been remarkably resilient. We're continuing to see a system that steps up to meet record high demand. And when you look at the official projections from the International Energy Agency, the Energy Information Administration, keep in mind that this is an environment that's still viewed from an oil market perspective as very well supplied. And give or take the seasonality we're talking about in natural gas, we're still meeting record global gas demand. So let's have some embedded faith that the system works well and the system continues to find ways to, to step up and invest. We need cogent policies to continue to make sure that can happen. Whether it's hurricanes, or whether it's geopolitics, we're continuing to see a system that works together. I'd refer people to go to txoga.org, texoga.org. Our monthly, our quarterly outlook and articles that I write, and then our weekly chart book, which actually monitors a lot of this. You know, If you really like the blow by blow and at a glance can get vital financial market and other personal information out of reading those things, it's all available. And we try to make it freely available for people to get. I promote this on LinkedIn. People can connect with me there as well. For our listeners, viewers, we're going to start featuring Dean's weekly and this week in the Autonomy Economy newsletter. So sign up for that. It, data will be there. I'll be able to read his charts. They're fascinating. You learn a lot about the oil markets, the global economy. And I'll say it this way, good policy equals good business. And there's a reason why the Texas economy is booming. The future is right. The future is autonomous. The future is a growing and healthy oil and natural gas markets. Dean, thank you as always for coming on the road to autonomy, autonomy economy. We can't wait to have you on again in September. Look forward to it. Thanks again. I enjoyed the conversation.